and welcome to today's uh, AHN Nephrology Educational Webinar. And today's is series number 41. My name is Egina Makwabe. I'm the consultant nephrologist and physician, and also chief medical director of Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. And today's uh, topic is traditional medicine and renal involvement. In involvement. We have Omira Anandi. Thank you, Omira, for joining and accepting uh, to come and yeah, thank present. You. Thank you, Egina. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, guys, so I'll start. I'll start All early. Right. Okay, so, so, so uh, Omira is a senior consultant nephrologist and head of department of nephrology, Yoshida Hospital, Secunderabad in, in India. And she's an International Society of Nephrology, Faro in Bristol, UK, and also International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, uh, Faro, uh, University of Toronto, Canada. And she has had uh, over eight uh, publications and presentations, including papers and both international and, and national in India. So he'll be, she'll be taking us through uh, traditional medicine and renal environment. Dr. Amira, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. This is my third interaction with all of you. And uh, I since apologize for the delay. So today's talk is uh, something very near to our heart and it in involves everybody in the world. That is traditional medicines and renal involvement. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'll go through an introduction. And there is some literature coming about nephrotoxic chemicals in traditional medicines and how they damage cells in the kidney. Then go through various renal syndromes which we have when we consume traditional medicines. Briefly, a little bit on detail about aristolochic acid nephropathy, the prototype of traditional medicine and renal involvement. Then about heavy metals and herbs, a very important issue in India. And finally, how do we prevent these renal adverse events and what is the way forward and summaries and conclusion. Now, we need to understand the concept of traditional medicine. When we say traditional medicine, it, it encompasses herbal remedies, folk remedies, complementary medicines, that is medicines which are added to our allopathic medicines or alternative remedies that which we use in place of our allopathic medicines. And then there is a, you know, an adverse connotation when we use words like concoctions, potions, and toxins, as if there is some witchcraft or something. But it is not so. As you go through my talk, then there is not to, to understand about traditional medicines. Now, the medicines which we practice is actually biomedicine, which is tr traditionally called Western or allopathic or the conventional medicine. Now, use of traditional medicine is not just a problem of Africa or Asia or India. It is a problem worldwide. In fact, parts of Central America and America use medicines more than the rest of the world. And in fact, it is more than $150 billion business all over the world. Its use is predominantly very established in China and then parts of India and various parts of Africa. It is, as we said, is not just a problem with low middle income country. This is a recent notice which has been put up in NHS where all people have been cautioned against the use of medicine by Baba Ramdev, a very famous Indian, I mean, what do you say, saint or yoga healer who has a billion dollar business of traditional medicines. And they have, NHS has cautioned people not to use his medicines in type one diabetes. So it shows that even in a Western, developed, educated country, the use of traditional medicines is very frequent. Now, traditional medicines have been part of healing process for millions of years, I mean, centuries. It is actually practiced in remote areas all over the world where allopathic medicine or modern healthcare facilities are not available. It is actually reflective of inequities of healthcare present worldwide. It is scientifically and rationally used in China, and it is also part of the over-the-counter medications worldwide in Western world. In, especially in diseases where we believe it's difficult to treat or is irreversible. It's also part of nutritional supplements in America and Western world. Now, why do we use traditional medicines? There are many reasons. One is the influences that we have from the media and from our social network, our friends and colleagues who suggest 
that some of these medicines will be good. In our childhood, my mother used to give me some traditional concoctions whenever I used to feel cold. So there is an influence in the family and friends. And then there are perceptions. There is a benefit that these are beneficial in contrast to our uh, uh, Western medicine where we believe there are lots of side effects and many of us have, have got experienced side effects of these medicines. Many people believe that traditional medicines are also safe and many of us are willing to try and use it in situations where we believe allopathic medicine does no good. And there is a healthcare need. It may be only option or no other options exist in certain parts of the world for your healthcare needs. So traditional medicines is being used and I believe it will stay. Now, what is the problem with traditional medicines from nephrologists? There is various factors which lead to nephrotoxicity. Some of them are related to the herbs that we use, the intrinsic toxicity of the herbs. Sometimes we don't identify the, the faith healers, don't identify the right talk, uh, herb and give us in fact a different uh, herb. This is very important when we discuss aristolochic acid nephropathy. It may not be the herb, how we process, how we store. An example I'll give when you have not stored a herb properly, which can lead to an acute kidney injury. Adulteration is common. In the process of concrete preparing these herbs or these liquids, we may adulterate with many things and you'll be surprised the amount of adulteration this happens in herbal medicines, which actually is responsible for the kidney involvement rather than the herbs. And contamination of heavy metals can be because of pollution or from the fertilizers that are used in the soil in which the plants grow. Now, treatment factors. Sometimes we don't know how much dose has to be given, duration of the dose, and the type of administration. Oral medicines are given either uh, by enemas or something like that, and that also causes problems. And then we have interaction. Many of our patients without reporting take herbal medicines, which may have an adverse interaction with allopathic medicines or they are being taken by them. I'll give an example of this also as we go around. And the condition, if it's a chronic kidney disease, if you use a lot of herbs, you are prone to develop hyperkalemia and other problems. And the drug may be useful in a certain gender or in certain age and may not be useful. Like our allopathic medicines, we say these drugs are not to be used in infants or in elderly people or during pregnancy. That kind of categorization, unfortunately, does not e exist with traditional medicines. So it is the excess of dose, the wrong herbs, wrong site of use, or an inherent genetic intolerance for the herbs, incompatible combinations or improper processing. All this together, in fact, affect the development of nephrotoxicity in traditional medicine. One of the examples is incorrect preparation. This is star fruit, which if you use incorrectly or use in a higher dose, often lead to, the star fruits have very high dose of, have high levels of oxalic acid, and you can develop acute oxalate nephropathy and crystal induced AKI if you don't use these star fruits properly. Similarly, instead of using morning cypress, you, you use morning cypress, another kind of dye, and you let develop flavonoid induced acute, not only kidney damage, but hepatic dysfunction. So you may use a wrong herb and get in trouble because of acute kidney injury. Now these are various uh, nephrotoxic herbal herbs there. And if you look into it, there's a, this is the classical Franchi group of herbs, which is responsible. For the nephrotoxic compound is aristolochic acid. Then you have mother word where leonurine is a nephrotoxic compound. Cinnamon bark, there is cinnamaldehyde. Beetle nut palm seed, which is used in India, aricolin is the nephrotoxic, two sandan fruit, two sandanin, snake gourd, trichosanthin, crotons, protein. So all these herbs have various uh, nephrotoxic chemicals which are responsible for renal damage. Some of these uh, herbs like real gar, cinnabaris, have high levels of in contamination with arsenic, mercury, and other elements. And they are also responsible for acute kidney injury. And the mechanism in China, because of its use in almost 20 to 25% of population, there is a lot of literature in Western literature where mechanism of kidney damage has been studied and the common mechanisms responsible for kidney involvement is apoptosis with mercury, oxidative damage with the palmitum seeds, cytokine activation, ischemic damage, both with aristolochic acid, immune 
modulation by Coke-Perry roots and direct DNA damage of acetylocic acid. All this I will discuss when I discuss a little more with the toxicity of acetylocic acid. This is a busy and a very complicated slide where you see all these nephrotoxic chemicals present in herbs like acetylocic acid, leonurin, and this palmitin, which leads to an activation either of the TGF smart pathway or formation of DNA adducts in acetylocic acid, leading to mitochondrial dysfunction, reactive oxygen species formation, various apoptosis changes, and this pathway of NF kappa beta factor transcription factor activation. All these uh, pathophysiological mechanisms have been studied and elucidated as mechanisms for nephrotoxicity with traditional medicines. Now, in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll go through the clinical syndromes which have been described in Western literature with the use of traditional medicines. The first one is electrolyte and acid-based abnormalities, rhabdomyolysis, commonest is acute kidney injury, reported maximum in literature, chronic kidney disease, glomerular diseases, some patients develop obstructive nephropathy, and finally, urothelial cancers. All this involvement is seen with various forms of herbs and traditional medicines. Electrolytes and acid-based abnormalities are seen with many herbs like hyperkalemia happen, as I said, with herbal juices, which are used in nutritional supplement, especially in patients who already have reduced GFR in chronic kidney disease. Hypokalemia is seen with a herbal tonic from Korea, which is used for cancer cure. Hypernatremia is seen with oolong tea. Oolong tea are used for weight loss. Hypermagnesemia, when some of the epilepsy traditional medicines contain magnesium oxide, smart of them because magnesium is a CNS depressant, but not used properly can develop hypermagnesemia. Metabolic alkalosis is seen with some herbal teas from America causing cough syrup and in cough, the teas are used for cough syrups. Metabolic acidosis have been seen with various herbal mix, mixtures from East Asia, Eastern Asia, where these herbal mixtures are used for weight loss supplements or cancer cure. So various electrolyte and acid-based abnormalities have been reported in literature with the use of alternative medicine. Now, Fanconi syndrome is the conglomeration of many of these electrolyte abnormalities, which is seen in various medicines. It's been seen with aristolopic acid, but it is also seen with Ayurvedic medicine in India. This is a paper published in Indian Journal of Medic Nephrology where a lady postpartum developed a Fanconi syndrome and acute kidney injury because use of Ayurvedic medicine. And this was believed to be because of heavy metals. Heavy metals form a very important part of Indian medications. And these lead, arsenic, and copper toxicity led to tubular dysfunction with the manifestation similar to a proximal RTA. Rhabdomyolysis is seen because in, in some of these uh, herbal medicines or traditional medicines, muscle breakdown is a mechanism by which herbal medications achieve weight loss. But if it is too much or too excessive of these drugs, this muscle breakdown can lead to rhabdomyolysis and can cause acute renal failure. Some of these drugs for weight loss are used in menstrual cycle disorders and they have been shown to cause rhabdomyolysis. Sometimes this over-the-counter traditional medicines when used with allopathic medications as used with trabecitidine can cause rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is commonly and in, very interestingly seen in Morocco where the hair dye, henna is mixed with paraffin in diamine. This has been seen in India also. There are reports from India. Whereas in Morocco, the hair dye is made up of a seed called Takaut el Badia. These are seeds of Tamaris orientalis. Now, this herb or a plant is not available easily. So in scarcity for hair dye in Morocco, instead of using Tamaris orientalis, they use another dry herb called Takaut rumia. And this is a case report where the use of this hair dye used for a uh, hand decoration actually lead, led to hypersensitivity reaction and an anaphylactic shock kind of a picture leading to acute kidney injury. Now, acute kidney injury is the commonest renal involvement seen with traditional medicine. In fact, in low middle income countries and in the developing world, in studies, some of the studies have shown, especially from Africa, 30 to 35% of acute kidney injury is actually because of traditional medications. 
Sometimes it is not just a simple AKI, but is associated with other organ involvement like hepatic dysfunction, neurological manifestations, and coagulopathy. AKI is mostly because of intravascular volume depletion, gastroenteritis, and hypovolemic shock. In some patients, you may need renal replacement therapy. Papers from Africa have shown that mortality can be as high as 40% in this group. This is very, very abrupt and very dramatic effect of traditional medicines. Now, traditional medicines can cause acute kidney injury because of contamination. Classical is the use of holy water in various uh, Catholic uh, enterprises where the color of the water is blue. And this blue is met by heavy metal intoxication, sometimes with copper sulfate and potassium bromide. And excess of these metals can lead to acute kidney injury. Sometimes to enhance the effect of the traditional medicines, some, sometimes the traditional Chinese medicines are enhanced or increased with the use of ephedramine, chloroferamine, chlorpheniramine, and phenacetin. This excess use of these allopathic medicines can also damage the kidney. An unusual mode of administration of the herbal medications can cause problem. In parts of Central Africa, there are people who use herbal anemia. Frequent use of these herbal enemas can cause colonic complications of dehydration, bleeding, and shock. Replacement of the natural substitute, we discussed on rhabdomyolysis with an AKI, which happens with hair dye substitution, and an unintentional co-administration. In a transplant patient who was on cyclosporin, there are reports that when they also use St. John's word for as a nutritional supplement, now St. John's word actually metabolizes cyclosporin faster. So in a patient that, who is using both of them, the cyclosporine levels come down, leading to an acute rejection and AKI. So we, whenever we see our patients, we should always take a history of co-administration of traditional medicines. Now, adulteration, this is a paper from NEGN. Herbal remedies are adulterated with various toxic I'm products, reacting. alkaloids, microorganisms, bacterial endotoxins, pesticides, fumigating agents, toxic metals, and various drugs. So all this ac acute kidney injury and toxicity and renal involvement may not be because of the herbs. It may be because of the contaminant which goes in the processing and manufacturing of these herbs. Now, the herbs which have been seen to be involved with AKI, I'll just briefly go through. The commonest, one of the common ones I think you are all aware of is Impila which is seen in Africa, used for various diseases like prevention of dreams, fertility issues, as a vermicide, blood purification. Uh, excess use of uh, calipes laurelia can cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, AKI, liver dysfunction, acidosis, and biopsy studies have shown severe ATN. Some of these patients even need dialysis. The other dye is classically is the aloe group, the aloe capensis, which is used in South Africa, for the treatment of hypertension and arthritis. This also leads to hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, shock and acute tibular necrosis. A paper showed that it is not the excess use of the uh, aloe that was irresponsible. It was actually aloe capensis has a resin called in capo aloes, aloes and it is a well-known laxative. And if you use a high dose of this or frequently abused laxatives, you may develop AKI and this causes gastrointestinal inflammation in ATN. And the papers which have been published, actually the toxicity is not because of an overdose, but because the laxative was kept in a Coca-Cola bottle and because of sun exposure, there were degradation of the toxic compounds leading to AKI. So storage of herbal medicines can also be responsible, maybe the culprit for renal involvement. The other dyes, the mushrooms which are used in Eastern Asia can also cause gastroenteritis, dehydration, and hepatic failure. Then we have this cat's claw, which is present in South America, which is again used for diseases as um, wide as cirrhosis, gastritis, gonorrhea, genital cancers, even as an anti-inflammatory drug. This has causes AKI, but this is not just predominantly ATN, but in acute interstitial nephritis. That's some, some form of an allergic manifestation of the drug. Besides herbal medicines, even fish, the gallbladder of fish is being used as a herbal remedy. And this fish gallbladder of, um, from Indonesia actually causes severe renal and liver damage and man manifests as nausea, vomiting, 
oliguria, fluid overload, and may require dialysis. And it is important to make a diagnosis and actually prevent the use of this fish gallbladder, which is frequently used in Indonesia for fatigue, fatigue and erectile dysfunction. Now, if you look into it, we understand that most of the cause of renal failure is because of hypoperfusion and a prenatal state, which leads to ATN. And a simultaneous involvement of the liver can also develop hepatorenal, acute fulminant hepatitis leading to hepatorenal syndrome. But then there are literature where the use of herbal medicines in patients with intrinsic renal disorders and actually provoked the worsening of this kidney involvement. Acute interstitial nephritis predominantly is also seen in some of these herbs, especially in quinqueloba herbs in this root, which is used for cardiovascular diseases. A biopsy usually shows very high infiltration of lymphocytes and eosinophils, and you have telltale signs of allergic manifestations in the skin. And these are, this is predominantly an AIN rather than an ATN. Other studies have shown, this is a paper from Mexico where the use of this herbal product called Recover AI actually led to development of a rapidly progressive renal failure and the biopsy showed intense inflammatory infiltrate with generally preserved tubular epithelium. This patient actually needed dialysis and rec recovered over the period of time. Now, chronic kidney disease, the other renal syndrome, which is very common with these kind of drugs, because the use is, the decline is slow and pro progressive, it is often difficult to detect the culprit traditional medicine and often underreported and there is a progressive worsening leading to a tubular and interstitial fibrosis, which is classically seen in aristolochic acid. Sometimes crystal deposition and urolithiasis can also cause chronic kidney disease. Some developed acute acquired cystic kidney disease. And I'll discuss an interesting case of papillary necrosis that is analgesic nephropathy. And finally, persistent use of these medicines can develop urothelial malignancies. The herbs which have been shown to cause chronic kidney disease, the classical, the fancy group of drugs, the, which can, whose main toxic compound is aristolochic acid, which causes chronic kidney disease and urothelial malignancy. Then we have a chaparral tea from West, uh, I mean America, Central America, which causes renal cysts and renal carcinoma. Mahuan causes nephrolithiasis. Jenkol beans are classically used in Indonesia, Malaysia, and parts of Southeast Asia, where it causes nephrolithiasis, obstructive nephropathy, and chronic kidney disease. Star fruit we discussed because of oxalate nephropathy. Willow bark, the bark of willow causes renal papillary nephrosis. And then there are various others like yohim bean, use of yohim bean has been shown to cause lupus nephritis, chronic interstitial nephritis, and wisteria causing chronic kidney disease. The prototype of traditional medicine renal involvement is aristolochic acid nephropathy. And it was actually delineated and understood in the 1990s in Europe when there was a bout of uh, an epidemic of progressive renal failure following the use of slimming pills. Now, if you look into this, these are pills which contain herbs of Stephania tetrandia and Mag Magnolia officinalis. Now, to enhance the effect of the slimming effect of these herbs, these two uh, herbs were added extra. Now, Stephania tetrandria belongs to a Chinese family of herbs called Hang Fangji, which is actually very similar to another family of herbs called Guang Fangji. Now, the major example of Guang Fangji was Astrolochia Fangji. Now, what happened uh, over the years, instead of Stephania tetrandria, that is Maung Tu, Mutong, they started using Aristolochia Fangji. And this use or substitution of Stephania tetrandia by Aristolochia fangi led to the increased development of chronic kidney disease. And over studies, there have been a large amount of literature, this culprit chemical to uh, toxin called Aristolochic acid was identified. And initially it was thought to be called as Ch Chinese herb nephropathy. But then we believe we cannot just blame a nation, which is very common uh, fact practice now for all the problems. And it has also been seen that this aristolochic acid is also responsible for the slowly progressive but a milder form of chronic kidney disease called Balkan endemic nephropathy. Now, 
studies have shown when people were using fang chi the original gu uh, fang chi the level of uh, the development of end stage renal disease or the odds ratio of developing end stage disease, disease was almost double but the moment motown aristolochia fang chi was added the risk and the odds ratio of developing end stage kidney disease actually almost became six times more so these are studies which have shown the association of these herbs with development of end stage kidney disease now aristolochic acid has a predilection to accumulate in the kidneys it it does because it binds to the organic acid transporters in into the tubules and through that in, they get accumulated in the proximal tubule and in various other tubules of the kidney and in the kidney it is believed to actually cause vasoconstriction by increasing the levels of endothelin leading to progressive ischemia hypoxia tubular injury and inflammation finally fibrosis it has also been shown in literature to activate the tgf beta path smart pathway which leads to as we know by various mechanism developing into the development of progressive fibrosis nowadays it's difficult to biopsy patients with aristolochic nephropathy because first of all the drug is banned in many countries and i mean the herb is banned in many countries and also by the time you understand that they have developed chronic kidney disease the kidneys have become shrunken but there are animal experiments which you see in this mice when you feed them with aristolochic acid initially you see minor changes but over the period of time after 20 days of using aristolochic acid you see tubular damage denudation of the tubular epithelium and progressive fibrosis so there the histopathology of aristolochic acid nephropathy is classical progressive renal fibrosis the clinical features of aristolochic neph nephropathy is progressive renal failure minimal or no edema hypertension anemia tubular dysfunction in the form of metabolic acidosis glycosuria amino aciduria later contracted kidney and a classical form of urethelial carcinoma that is the upper ure urinary tract carcinoma this has been reported worldwide and now it is being regulated use and banned in many countries you will be surprised that this is a paper from congo where it has been shown a congolese faith healer for the treatment of chronic kidney disease i repeat for the treatment of chronic kidney disease actually uses various products like aloe vera gingiber ophinalis officinalis but also 4% of his patients received chinese products the effect of globalization hence the product is available worldwide even though banned in many countries now now this manifestation of papillary necrosis is actually the history of autopsy of beethoven the famous music composer if you look into his autopsy it has been shown that when he died he had tremendously swollen feet he had oliguria there was and he actually died of fluid overload and the autopsy findings besides liver involvement liver cirrhosis also showed presence of renal papillary necrosis there was perirenal fibrosis with calcified necrotic papillae and the authors believe this was because of the prolonged use of analgesics that was he derived from the bark of this willow willow bark actually has a chemical called sialicin the sialicin is the precursor for acetyl salicylic acid and it is believed beethoven may be the earliest one of the earliest case reports of analgesic nephropathy herbal medications have been increasingly uh, recognized as a factor for the development of chronic kidney disease of unknown origin now chronic kidney disease of unknown origin is a syndrome of cluster of cases which are noted is in form of epidemic slowly growing epidemic in various tropical parts of the world it has been shown in central america where it is called as mesa american nephropathy it's been seen in sri lanka and in india known as udhanam nephropathy now who believes one of the multi factors involved in the progressive development of ckd u is use of herbal medications this paper from sri lanka has actually showed that patients from the ckdu belt actually use a whole lot of ayurvedic medicines from india and one of the components of these medicines is aristolochia indica uh, aristolochic acid containing herb growing in india so the use of these herbs can also be responsible for this phenomenon of chronic kidney disease of unknown origin 
Obstructive nephropathy leading to CKD has been seen with the use of Jenkol pins. These beans are used in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And in acutely, they cause hematuria, acute kidney injury, and crystal-induced tubular obstruction. But they are used, these are Jenkol beans, and they are long-term use. The crystals from NIDUS, and they form chronic nephrolithiasis, Jenkolic stones, and then lead to chronic interstitial nephritis. This form of chronic kidney disease is called Jenkolism. We discussed about star fruit where they develop acute and chronic oxalate nephropathy. So stones can also lead to progressive chronic kidney disease. There are reports of glomerular diseases, especially that of lupus nephritis in use of herbal medications. There are various case reports. In children, the use of herbal medicines have been led to the development of minimal change disease and both of these kids actually improved with the use of steroids. Now we come to another major serious complication of aristolochic acid that is of urothelial carcinoma. Urothelial carcinoma has been reported in the early 90s, especially from Taiwan where they have shown a large amount of uh, epidemics of development of upper tract cancers with the use of aristolochic acid associated herbs. And what is it has been seen that this kind of carcinoma cancer is not just seen in patients who develop end-stage renal disease because of aristolochic acid nephropathy, but also in cases where the kidney function may not be that bad. So it is not an end-stage kidney disease which goes on to develop urothelial cancer secondary to aristolochic acid, but cancers can happen even early stages of chronic kidney disease. So we should be aware if people are still using aristolochic acid. These cancers are transitional cell layer of the upper in, in affect the upper layer of the upper, the transitional cell layer of the upper urinary tract. This happens because aristolochic acid binds with DNA and develop DNA adducts and the mutations leads to a AT to TA transversion. And this is a unique mutation not seen in any other form of urothelial cancer. And this transversion, this mutation leads to an activation of the HRAS oncogene and over expression of P53 which subsequently leads to development of transitional cell carcinoma. Now briefly a little bit about heavy metals in traditional medicines. Heavy metals can be accidentally contaminated or an adulterant when her traditional medicines are processed or manufactured or as in India, the heavy metals actually form a part of herbal medication cocktail. And we know heavy metals have been implicated in various uh, nephropathy, like Balkan endemic nephropathy initially was thought to be secondary to lead in intoxication. There has been reports from China where mixing of arsenic, mercury, had, to enhance the potency of the drugs have led to development of chronic kidney disease. Heavy metals actually form a common constitution of a group of med medicines called Siddha in India. These are traditional medications which are commonly used in South India. We report a case from our part of the, uh, in our hospital, where a patient actually was using a Siddha medicine for his weakness and led to development of neurological symptoms of ataxia, rigidity, and tremors. And finding on investigation, it was found to have that his toxicological, toxicological screen had very high levels of aluminium. He also developed an acute kidney injury and hence he underwent a biopsy. His MRI actually shown this peri periventricular en uh, enhancements because of the aluminum overload. And the biopsy showed a classical picture of interstitial nephritis with predominantly lymphocytes and ma large number of eosinophils. The electron microscopy of this patient showed tibular vacuolation. So it was a predominant acute interstitial nephritis because of a use of high levels of aluminium in the herbal medicine. There are papers from India where use of uh, Indian medications which contain heavy metals have led to the development of membranous nephropathy. This is a paper recently published from South India from Jipper Pondicherry where they have reported eight cases who have all developed uh, membranous nephropathy secondary to the use of predominantly Siddha medications. And all of them, when the mercury levels were tested, the levels were persistently very high, in some cases even seven times higher than the permissible limit. Another paper from South India from Chennai had shown again a case series of patients who developed membranous nephropathy 
with the chron chronic consumption of traditional Indian medicines called Siddha and Ayurveda. And in these group of patients also, it was believed that the heavy metals, especially arsenic or a mercury intoxication was responsible for the development of membranous nephropathy. Now, how do we prevent these adverse renal events? The most important thing that we need to do is develop a tight regulation control of these medications. Now, herbal medicines in the United States is con considered as nutraceuticals. So they are not under less, I mean, as severe con rigorous control as other medicines, allopathic medications are. And FDA often gives approval of this use of these drugs as OTC nutritional supplements. Whereas in Western Europe, especially in Germany and parts of Taiwan, herbal medicines are considered as drugs and they have to go through all the process that is required for allopathic med medicines before they get regulatory approval. I think the same should be done all over the world. And in Taiwan, it has been actually shown banning or regulation of use of herbs containing aristolochic acid had actually led to significant reduction of urological malignancies. Not only regulatory, government regulatory, we should also form groups for pharmacological vigilance and also some kind of a societal oversight. We should all, not just as doctors, but as a part of society should be aware of the impact of this traditional medicine. This is a paper from, I mean, this is an incident from Nigeria where this teething baby mixture called my picking was introduced in October in 2008. And with the, this became very popular. And when this my picking was being used for all babies, there was an increased, a very high incidence of pediatric AKI. And when the press got to know about it and when the media made a big hue and cry, the drug or the product was withdrawn from the market. And you see how nicely the incidence of pediatric AKIs have come down. So it is our responsibility also to be aware of these drugs and bring to light the possibility of nephrotoxicity of these over-the-counter traditional medicines. Now, can we ban all traditional medicines? I believe that is just impractical and counterproductive because you cannot change the mindsets, attitudes, and practices of both allopathic and indigenous health practitioners all over the world. It is important that we need to understand why these drugs have been used and try to address the cause rather than the solution. And these drugs have been there for years together. In India, Siddha has been practiced for more than 5,000. Ayurveda has been practiced for more than 5,000 years. And we cannot just you know, do away with this practice. So what is important is, is to integrate both the traditional and the biomedicine together. And, and we have seen the benefits of integrating this practice. Metformin comes from herbs, the florizins, the, the florizins that which we are now using in almost every condition in the world comes from tree bark, cyclosporin comes from a fungus, aspirin, as we said, we alluded to Beethoven's uh, autopsy, the salicylic, the drug of the last 20th century actually comes from willow tree bark. So we should be able to synthesize and use this um, herbal medicines in a rational way for its benefit. And there is literature also, there's some traditional medicine. This is from Africa where this up tablet, Bu, Kinkaliba tablet and Kinkaliba Bu has been compared with Capropril. And if you see the tablets and the drugs actually show comparative antihypertensive potential as much as that of Capropril. So we should use these drugs in trials and rationally use them for their beneficial effects. There are many, many literature of use of traditional medicines in childhood, IgA vasculitis, chronic kidney disease in non-AA traditional TCMs, nephrotic syndrome, and in IgA nephropathy. So use of these drugs in a rational, dose-dependent manner with follow-up can have shown a lot of benefits. So ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, renal involvement in traditional medicine is known and it is there. It is of common but often underreported. The commonest detected abnormality is the traumatic presentation of acute kidney injury. CKD is often seen in prolonged use. Often the method of procurement, the processes of manufacturing, adulteration is responsible for the nephrotoxicity and the, not the drug per se. 
we should all, as practitioners of allopathy, should keep an open mind in dealing with these situations, should be aware, detect them early, and re remove the offending medicines, but simultaneously be sympathetic to the patient's needs and requirements and to understand why they use these medicines. The integration of traditional and medical practices with rational scientific use, I believe is the way forward, which will reduce the renal involvement at various other toxicity of these medicines dramatically. Before I close, I want to acknowledge the help of Dr. Shivakumar Gondar from Ho Chi Minh City University in Vietnam. It was he who got me interested in this interesting talk of, uh, area of uh, nephrotoxicity in traditional me medicine. And I would like to thank Professor Valerie Lusix. I have borrowed some of her slides from the WCN21 meeting just presented in April. And finally, my students who are present there, who always drive me and when, to find out answers for their questions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. All right, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Umira. That was very interesting and you know, excellent presentation from your side. And um, so it's, it's a time for question and answers uh, or comments, but um, uh, maybe I should start uh, um, uh, you know, with a comment from uh, my country uh, in Tanzania, where you know the use of traditional medicine is quite high, and this is because um, the provision of healthcare to the remote areas is not, uh, you know, it's not that there, it's not there, so it's poor, and therefore people depends on traditional medicine for them to, you know, to survive. So the, the use of traditional medicine is, is very high, but the challenge that we have, okay, we don't know what are the nephrotoxins that are there in the traditional medicine our, our patients are using. So that's the challenge, probably uh, research is needed, you know, so that we can know exactly which uh, traditional medicine can cause uh, nephrotoxicity or which cannot, and the one that cannot cause nephrotoxicity. So that was an eye opener and a very good presentation, uh, Dr. Omeda. And so, uh, any uh, comment and question from the audience? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Egina. I mean, actually, there is. I, I did not have time to present from uh, the First Nation countries in uh, in Quebec. They are actually looking at where there is a very high incidence of diabetes. They're looking at the common herbs that these. Uh, people use in uh, Quebec, Canada, and they are extracting these herbs by various methodology to find the chemical composition of these drugs. And then they're studying in animal experiments to find out what they did do to beta cell function, insulin sensitivity, and other things. I think the way to go forward is not to tell all traditional medicines are bad. We have to find out what are the com compositions of these medications, try to utilize them, and develop, and develop a manufacturing, regulated manufacturing process in a scientific manner and utilize in, in our own part of the world. Dr. Ekina, what you see in Tanzania is what we see in India. Many of our patients don't take traditional medicines because they are amused by it or they find it is uh, fun. They use it because they don't have any other option. Thank you very much. You know, you are very right. So uh, other- There is a question uh, yeah. asking, how long does it uh, average take patients to develop renal involvement of aristolochic toxicity? Aristolochic toxicity can present with an acute Fanconi syndrome within four to six weeks of using the drug. The nephrotoxicity from the Belgian paper took over the use of these medicines for more than six months. And the follow-up of developing transitional cancers have happened any time between six months of using the drug with minimal or very mild renal involvement to end-stage kidney disease. Many patients have actually, aristolochic acid-induced nephropathy actually has a very rapid progression of renal failure. Development of end-stage kidney disease has happened over two to three years of, almost of a six months to eight months of use of these drugs. So consumption can be anywhere between six weeks to six months. But the nephrotoxic involvement or the nephrotoxic sequelae can be lifelong and devastating. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ijana, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, please, please. Yes, please. 
Uh, hi, Dr. Anand. I'm uh, Rajendra Bhima. I'm from uh, South Africa in Durban, so slightly different. I'm glad you mentioned Impila because I must say as a medical student and in my early training, we used to see a lot of Impila poisoning. And it should usually present with hypoglycemia, acute uh, liver failure, and of course, acute kidney injury. And I must say, sadly enough, the mortality rate was 100%, yes. irrespective of whether we dialyze the patient or what we did. I mean, there was no surviving. Mm -hmm. Once they presented, especially with hypoglycemia, it, it was really very sad. Fortunately, I must say, and I don't know whether it's really disappeared or what happened, but I have not seen any case for a very, very long time. See? But it may be because I'm at the tertiary quaternary hospital and they're not getting referred appropriately or they just demise before they come. But I must say, I even for my um, fellow colleagues, I have not seen this. So it's it's something good that has happened because it was a really the, a devastating form of intoxication. The current See? belief is actually the numbers are coming down. Parts of South Africa don't use uh, Impila because the, the healthcare facilities have improved. And I believe as yes. we we substitute or improve our healthcare to remote accessible areas, it will come down. And I was talking to Dr. Valerie, she said it was 100% in the turn of the century. In, 2000 to, in 2005, yeah. Yeah. she said it was 100%. Now with the use of renal uh, aggressive uh, hydration uh, detection, the mortalities have come down to 30 to 40%. And cases have also come down dramatically. That's all. Thank and it's a pleasure yeah. to talk to all of you. I mean, uh, <laughs> So much of similarity of uh, medical practice between you and us. That's on it. Yeah, there, there is, is a chat box. The chat box is somebody has mentioned that Sudan common cause of AKI is hair dye. Can I know who's? I would like to know uh, if a little bit about that. The person. This is Nahala Alam. Will she be able to? Uh, uh, you, you want her to comment or to to speak out? Uh, what is it? Uh, osmotic. Uh, uh, she's not there. Lloyd, I don't know which are the medicines banned by BMJ. Will you elaborate a little bit? Well, what is the ETO? What is that? What is the toxin there? This is, I think, the, the the nature of the drug. Like is as we showed in aristolochic acid, these toxins actually bind to certain receptors, which sort of internalize them in cells in the kidney. And this is specific, like that organ organic acid transporters, which are specific predominantly to the kidney and some parts of the brain, aristolochic acid binds to them. And so the accumulation happens in a single organ. So maybe there are herbs which accumulate in liver cells and get metabolized, forming <coughs> toxic metabolites. And majorly kidney is involved because it excretes all the toxins. So the predominant uh, toxicity is kidney of the traditional medicines is because of its excretion. Because everything has to pass through the kidney. And similarly, some of them simultaneously also develop liver damage because when you eat, all of them have to pass through the liver also. It is the tropism of the drug, its mechanism of uh, intracellular uh, involvement and damage. So herbal medicines also are choosy in what organs they damage. One question uh, is uh, from your uh, uh, I mean, uh, knowledge, uh, which is the commonest cause of, uh, you know, uh, traditional medicine induced failure? Commonest cause meaning, I can't tell you the name. I think the Siddha medications in India. And uh, and uh, the chronic kidney disease, the commonest literature and rationale is from traditional Chinese medicine. China has a lot of literature. They have reported uh, chronic kidney disease. They, theirs is predominantly chronic kidney disease. AKI in Africa wow. is very prominent with the use of uh, all these herbs. So in India, okay. we believe in the traditional Indian medicine, which has been responsible for chronic kidney disease or glomerular involvement is the Siddha group of medicines, where Siddha. all medicines have some amount of heavy metals. Heavy metal. So it's interstitial nephritis there. Chinese no, is more glomerular. Not just interstitial, there are papers showing membranous nephropathy. The membranous. Jipma group and the Apollo Chennai group have shown series yeah. of MN in these patients. That's all I think. And the Chinese are interstitial nephritis. The Chinese interstitial, herbs? Uh, yes, commonly acute, uh, inter acute and chronic interstitial nephritis. They still continue to use various of these drug and uh, herbs. And then you have something from America where we saw chaparral tea, from Peru, cat's claw, 
It is everywhere. Traditional medicines and renal involvement is all over the world. Each country has its own specific uh, group of medicines. But yes, CKD is uh, a very common in, uh, manifestation of this traditional medicines and acute interstitial nephritis. Thank you. Thank you. Mira, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. And thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful yes. session. Actually. Thank you. Very, very good. Yeah, it's, so. a, it's, a com it's a completely out of the world topic and, you know, a very uh, a rare topic and there's no literature available, you know, to really in-depth in literature not available and it's very interesting actually. It's true. And, uh, and very I'm sure little a lot of, we know about this. Only case yeah. reports we have. We don't have any yeah. trials or original series or articles, yeah. nothing. That's all. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for ev everyone who participated in these presentations today. Special thanks yeah. to Mira. There was one single question, whether herbs uh, beneficial to the kidney. Yes, there yes. is a slide I have put, and uh, there is a paper, in fact, a paper from St. John's, the medical college from where me and Lloyd come, by our pediatric nephrologist, Dr. Arpana Iyengar, has put up a paper where herbs have been shown to be useful in IJ vasculitis. So there is a oh. slide, and there are references uh, of herbs being beneficial in kidney. That's okay, all. I see. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so it can also be beneficial, not yeah. Yeah, only yeah, yes. not <laughs> always harmful. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a very interesting topic and a very good presentation. Special thanks to Dr. Omera.